going to look for quick wins. And I'm going to invite four people up onto the stage just to look at a real aspect of what we can do quickly to try and move forward with some of the issues we've discussed. We may not be able to jump 100% of the way, but if we can begin to do little things that we're moving down the right road and we're beginning to save ourselves money, we're beginning to give our customers better service, we're beginning to look after the environment, and hopefully with some of them, even then it releases the supply chain a little bit to concentrate on the right claims should a surge of some sort occur. So that will be taken into account all the things that the speaker said this morning. So onto the stage, please come uh, Matthew Parker of Procurator, Mark Devaney of Surestop, Kate McKenzie of Courtesy Kitchens and Bathrooms, and our old friend Neil Vickery from Coraventa. I didn't necessarily mean you were old, I just meant you're an old friend, Nick. So if you could welcome them onto the stage, please sit there. We've heard a lot of the big ideas, and they're really, really, really important. Yeah? But while we're ready to move there, what, what can we do in the short term, in small ways and specific ways in your own areas, that can really begin to, to make a difference? In other words, for example, I'm not looking at something that we say, we've got an idea, let's complete it all. We've got an idea to go in that direction, let's start moving. So where I'm going. Neil, what do you think we can do that would help that? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you and everyone from ILC for the great event today. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name's Neil Vickery. I'm the UK manager from Caravan, as you can see. Um, just a little touch on what we covered this morning, if you don't mind, Alan. Um, we're talking about surge events and whether we could cope earlier on this morning. Uh, we've just seen the mass massive devastation that floods have occurred in Europe and some in the UK. And whether you like it or not, manufacturers run out of equipment in Europe. So we're not ready for the, a surge event of any major catastrophe. Uh, but on to the subject now. Um, so small wins and uh, instant wins we can make. Uh, quite simple, really. Um, we can start by trying to achieve more with the equipment we already have and the personnel we already have. Um, we find that lots of people deploy equipment and it's not making any difference to the drying regime in the area that I feel and deal with. And by acting smarter and working cleverer, people can achieve an awful lot more and that can make a dramatic change on drying regimes and processes and get properties back to normal quicker rather than later. That, that's one of the big wins we can do. One of the other things I'd like us to do is almost go back to the start and see what we're trying to accomplish because we seem to have got caught up in a melee of checks and protocols. Um, as Steve Gelder said earlier on, there's that many people involved in the process that sometimes you can't see which way is the right way to get a property returned to the policyholder as quick as possible. And I think we need to re-energise that and almost go back to re-engineering it so we can accomplish a better job. Kate, okay, in, in some ways the improvement might come, we've talked there about process, but sometimes people don't talk to the experts quick enough in, in whatever area that is. So people might come along and say, right, okay, we've assumed this is a way of doing it and we then go down a route where too many people touch it. Do you find that there might be answers if people would just phone first and ask and you might be able to fix things for them? Um, yeah, I think, I think if anything, that post, well, what, anything that COVID taught us was the collaboration and talking to each other and uh, just just having a bit of a closer relationship with your network really can actually bring some really good things around. Um, we achieved things that we didn't even think was possible when lockdown came along, yet we managed to get our businesses through it and we managed to still continue and go on. Um, so I think, I think it's, it's key that we carry on that relationship now. Um, and make sure that we are speaking to the right people. We, we had a much more direct communication from people who instruct us, we experienced um, at the beginning of it. And we're trying to maintain that because we found that the whole, um, the process seemed a little bit easier. Uh, the customers seemed to, under, well, the homeowners seemed to understand what was going on a little bit clearer rather than just an unexpected phone call from myself, for example. Um, so that, I think there just needs to be a lot of clarity um, on processes and communication between everyone. Okay. Mark, from your side, I'm, I'm going to be quite direct about this one. Now, you have a range of, you're amongst a group of people who have a range of products, and sometimes the market wants to look at the most complete product 
rather than bit by bit. How easy is it to try and look how people can mitigate, for example, your example, can mitigate things rather than solve them, and we'll get to the solving stage later? Yeah, well, for us, we've got to understand what the issue is, and if it's the escape of water and the damage that that does, we've got to say to the client, do you want an escape? Escape of water will always happen. You're always going to get one. So we need to decide, do you want to be able to turn that water off in 10 minutes? Or do you want to have an issue and, and, and have the issue turn it off in two hours? And what we see that is, and, and Alan touched on earlier about climate change, a burst pipe or an escape of water over an hour is 900 litres of water. So would you stand in the kitchen with the tap on for one hour watching 900 litres of water go down that drain? Because that's what we're doing when we have escape of water. Forget your claim, the cost to repair, the drying out and everything else. It's the impact we have on other things with this escape of water. So for us, we can try and re-educate people of, of the, the, the client, the homeowner, the insurance company. Of, we can save water, we can save the cost to repair. But for us, is that the appetite? Or do, do, how do we get that across in this arena to make people be aware that we can save water environmentally, but also save money on the cost to repair and the, the services that's offered. So for me, that's, that's what I see. We can mitigate rather than compete, that's fine. Yeah. Matt, from procurement perspective, which is what we're trying to do as much as we can here, how can we make some quick wins faced with the supply issues we've got, post-COVID, stroke Brexit, whichever way round you want to, or both ways of doing it. Looking now at the environmental agenda and the amount of times that we're putting a carbon footprint over the place just as the beginning of that agenda. And also bearing in mind that, you know, we're still susceptible to catastrophes. Yeah, um, good question. So I think there's a lot of things and some people are doing it and some people aren't uh, in terms of what you could do. So um, one of the things um, we can see you could definitely do is, and, and we've been talking about it today, is around reducing the touch points um, in claims. So we think, you know, on average, you can take about a third of touch points out, out of a home claim. So. Um, we think that's a quick win for two angles. A, you know, the cost um, in terms of taking some of those touch points out, but also um, the environmental impact. So we think that's a quick win, mapping it out and, and, and just re-looking at that whole supply chain. We think that's definitely a quick win um, you can do. Um, digital claims, what everyone's spoken about today. Um, you know, for some insurance companies we work with, it's, you know, harder than, than others. So um, I think it's almost easier if you haven't started to actually start now in terms of getting digital claims and the technologies which are out there. So we think that's a, a definite improvement. And then I think the CO2 agenda is becoming, you know, really big in the supply chain. We've been talking about it um, today. And um, what we're seeing now is, you know, there's been a lot of work more in the motor side and now everyone's starting to, to ask us, well, what can we do in the, the home, home side? So we think there's um, definite areas to look at in terms of material usage and, and we think there's some good CO2 initiatives there to reduce CO2. But we also think that comes at, a, you know, at a, a, an increased cost, which you know, people have to, have to debate whether you know, if you want to pay you know, upwards of about 10% more on, on that claim for, for using more sustainable materials. But, we, we think those are some of the, the quick wins um, you, you can get on with now. Okay, thanks, Matt. Back to you, Neil. You, you talked to Elliot about people using the right equipment in the right way at the right time. Um, oh, I'll, I'll ask this carefully. You're going to have to answer it a lot more carefully than I ask it. <laughs> How much do you think procurement sometimes drives the bad practice that might take place? Um, to a large extent. Um, procurement seem to be caught up in looking at the bottom price, just purely about the physical price that they're going to pay somebody. And that is driving poor practice in the industry. People aren't prepared to spend the time on site to do the job properly first time, in a lot of instances, because they're not getting enough reward to do so. Um, time frames are drifting. We can see longer uh, driving life cycles in claims across the board. And really, procurement needs to get closer involvement in what's actually happening physically with the projects on site. And there seems to be a disconnect between procurement teams, both internal with insurance companies and external, um, with actually what the final package is that's offered uh, by the restoration industry. Um, yes, using the right equipment at the right time is essential. One of the things that drives me absolutely insane 
is even the ABI quote that once you let your house flooded, they might be drying it for six months. Why, why would we be drying a property for six months? Steve builds houses over there and properties, and two months after the brick works up, it's plastered and they're almost ready to move back into. And we're saying it's going to take six months to remove the moisture that was there from a flood. And it's nearly always because we haven't got the right procurement process, the right equipment's not being used in the right time frame. And you know, we, we call it and refer to it as drying insanity, where people will put a machine in, put some air movers in, and say, right, I'm drying that property. To go back the following week, it's still wet. Two weeks later, still wet. Four weeks later, still wet. Ten weeks later, still wet. And no one is standing back and saying, if I'm doing the same thing all the time, and I'm going to get the same results, I need to look at what else I can do and change to dry that property and achieve my goals. This is amazing. That's the guy who manufactures machines just telling you that you shouldn't be have to buy them quite as often as you do. I, I, I know it's a strange thing to say from a manufacturing point of view, but one of the big drivers we have is that we want you to achieve more with the machines you've already got. And I know that affects future sales and things like that. But if you can achieve more using our equipment, you'll buy our equipment again next time you come for the repurchase. And that's all we do it for. We want to achieve the best results you possibly can. How much, Kate, do you think you're encouraged by your customers to be imaginative or as imaginative as you think you can be in terms of finding solutions for them? <laughs> um, it's a difficult one because people, I think people are so, we're so used to looking at a product list and seeing that's all we, that we have on offer rather than questioning if anything else can be done, um, which is and I think that uh, goes back to with the COVID thing. All of a sudden, we, we took out of out of process, and we started doing things that we didn't think could be done. And I think as businesses, we probably should need to look at what we offer and can we be a little bit more flexible. We certainly try to and be adaptable if we need something. Uh, a particular customer needs something different to what we offer. We'd much rather that was asked of us than just assume not, like to come to us, like what, what you were saying about going to the experts earlier as well. Like sometimes I think we naturally assume, oh, somebody can't help us or that won't work, rather than going to someone and actually having that open discussion. And I think that's where we need to be a little bit more flexible in the chain of people managing the claim, rather than just saying yes or no, go actually, is there something out the box that we can do here? Mm, okay. Mark, you've tried, uh, you know, companies we have been trying to get good leak detection and uh, mitigation products into the market for a long time, but as you heard this morning, <coughs> it's not a market flush with money, uh, well, some people think there are margins to take it out elsewhere. How difficult is it to get a message across to people uh, in a price-driven, yeah. very tech market that actually there are some things you can invest in which mitigate and will make a quick difference environmentally and cost effectively to the customer. Well, it's that, it's the change, isn't it? It's people have, like I said earlier there, people have always done the same thing. They've always, in, in my experience, if there's a problem, they resolve the problem, they don't reset and try and understand how that could have been a different outcome. And for me, it's difficult to try and get that across to the insurance companies or to the repair and, and maintenance sort of side of that is, if we've got a product or we've got a solution between anybody on the stage, a solution that will make that easier, the first thing that people say to me is, who's going to pay for that? Is it the homeowner that wants to pay for that because they don't want the distress of the, 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 the escape of water or they don't want all the uplift and all the months out of that property? Or does the insurance company look at that and say, we'll fit it, we'll tie the homeowner in for so long and then we will tie that person into us for, for three years or whatever, and, and the mechanics behind that. But the minute the obstacle I've got is, who is actually, everybody thinks it's a great product, everybody that's visited the stand today has said it's a great product, it, it works really, really well, but who's gonna, initially, who's gonna foot the bill to have this product fitted? In long term, we'll stop all the problems that we're having and, and the hours and, and the months and months and the high, sort of, I think the, the, the number we've got on some literature was, the insurance companies pay £1.8 million pound out per day on water damage, whether that's escape of water, flood damage or something like that. What do we do about that? How can we start with a quick win 
by stating the water, the escape of water in a property can be from down to 10 minutes to five minutes or to four hours or a full weekend. We need to understand how we can have a quick win with that, whether it's with different products in the market, whether it be leak detection, whether it be the products that are out there already. Again, came back to full circle, who's gonna pay for that? And that's the issue we're having currently. Um, so for me, yeah, that's where we sit. We're just trying to find our fit in a very, good, very difficult market that understand the product, but don't commit to it. And I'm finding that the frustration. Back over to you, Matt. What, what, what should procurement people now be doing, both in process and practice, to meet the demands that we've heard of today? To be able to take into account much more flexibility and just to make it more effective. For example, target in the right areas, as Neil said, rather than target just the bottom, target the, the first part of it to make better decisions. So I think it's um, looking at the whole supply chain. So, I, you know, I think procurement teams, and, and I've been guilty in the past of this, is, is you know, looking at one certain area at a time, whether it's, you know, restoration or whether it's buildings. And I think there needs to be more, when, when reviews are taking place, looking at the whole end-to-end -end and, and understanding by pulling this lever, what happens here. I think linking a lot more in with um, other areas, and I was talking to this morning around, you know, how underwriting need to work, work better, you know, with claims and, and to join that process up. So, you know, we can have the discussions around, you know, sh who pays for, you know, the leak detection and things like that. Um, and then I think there's, there's a need for speed. So every supplier I speak to says, you know, things take too long to make decisions. Um, and there's a lot of ideas where I speak to suppliers with, with who they say, you know, basically you know, if it takes too long to implement or they're not implemented. So I think, you know, speed is, is the other key thing. I think, you know, what needs to change and is speed, you know, in terms of getting new innovation, but also speed to a change in market. Because it's, it's really clear that, you know, the whole, the whole market is really changing at the moment. So I think that speed to adapt and adjust is, is going to be key for any procurement department going forward. Okay. Um, third and last question for you all, because of all the three this morning, I'll start. And it's going to be about what do you think the quickest wins really are? What's going to have the quickest impact? But I also want where, where it affects, certainly from both Neil and Matt when I get there, the impact that the current supplier and labour shortage is having in the market as well. Because you've said earlier, you'd love to be able to provide loads of machines here, but as we've all seen, there's been a huge storms and floods in Europe, tragically, ending a lot of people's lives. So in reality, what are the quick wins that can help us get over that and begin to cope with any form of catastrophe or flood or something that happens here? Yeah. Uh, as you say, massive flooding yeah. throughout Europe uh, has caused huge issues and will continue to cause huge issues. I mean, we had shortage of supply of parts and then we've just been hit with the biggest surge event that Colavenza have ever had to deal with. Um, but from a, a quick wins scenario, if we can set the Ryan projects up correctly first time and insurers can get the restoration guys out there early on in the process, we can get jobs dried much, much quicker using the right equipment. Some of this is training and we've just moved offices and we've just invested £35,000 in new training facilities and we offer that to our customers so we can try and encourage them to learn and try new things and see how much quicker we can dry um, and projects can be completed. But we, we all feel sorry for the restoration companies when a property is being water damaged and it's six weeks ago before they get the instruction to come and do it. So insurers have got their part to play in getting people out there sooner. We can go and get the properties dried quicker. By getting them dried quicker, you can move your equipment on to the next job. You're not getting your, your technicians going back six and seven times to do a drying project. You've, you're done in three weeks, you can then almost do double the amount of workload and get the jobs done quickly. Um, I think it's essential that this is something we all look at because if we do get a catastrophe, if we do get one of these catastrophic events that Alan mentioned earlier, even if it's something like 2013 when we had 10,500 properties damaged in the UK, if we don't change now, we are really, really going to struggle, all of us in this room are going to struggle with trying to deal with that sort of level of claim. Never mind if it's the 70,000 properties in Germany flooded. You know, we've, we've got to make changes now, and there's a great saying, action TNT, action today, not tomorrow. 
And we're all here today and I'd like to think that everyone can go away and make some sort of change to make it better tomorrow or today even, rather than it just being another year before we meet up again and say, well, not much has changed. Okay, that would be delightful. Kate, from you, Randall, <coughs> give us a few examples. So you've talked generally about customer service now, but people will assume, when you, I'm not against any alternative accommodation companies here, but if people don't want to be rehoused and they want to go into some of the units that uh, ICAB and yourself sell, for example, what kind of things can you do that people don't think you can do? You give it a few things. I mean, I know there's things about driveways and tight spaces, etc., that people maybe just don't come and ask you about. Yeah, I think this goes back to the asking the experts. We're the ones who know the answer. We're the ones who are going out there, who deliver these things day in, day out. So um, there's been instances where we, we know that there's been back and forth between office staff, for example, of whether our product is an appropriate product. And I think this just highlights the, that caused such a delay for the customer who was for the homeowner who didn't know what was happening, didn't know where the claim was going, didn't know what the resolution was, which then creates stress for them when, and I, I can't remember who it was, but I'm sure in the last um, uh, event that we had, it was said something like that using our sort of pods and things can actually reduce the cost of the claim. Don't quote me on that, I might just be making that up. But if, if that's true, I mean, or even if it's just down to customer satisfaction, that they're happy, they're settled, they know what's happening. Um, I just, it, we need to make sure that those don't just assume that something can't go somewhere because the driveway looks steep to you or that you assume that there isn't enough space or that it's just not going to work because of your own eyes, go straight to the people who can give you a yes or no, but do it quickly as well so that people aren't going back and forth all the time. Always a phone call away, thanks. Mark, from your perspective, what's the quick wins that you can do for Escape of Water? For us, it's, it's going in and, and receive with an open mind. You're going to get a bit of a, a short-term pain of having to, to look at the product and understand how the other companies in the industry who, who do similar things to us, so they can help you reduce your cost for a long, long-term benefit. And they're all available now. The product's available to, 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 to fit and to just, to just do. And as we said, it's a little bit hard to change people's perspective of always done the same thing. If you've always had leaks and you've always paid big money out and you've always gone in and tried them for, for months and months and that's the norm and you've put them in accommodation and it's cost even more money, that can change and needs to change and long term that that is available now we just need to be open-minded about what is available and how that suits you as a as individuals or as businesses and, and companies of how involved you want to be early to be able to to benefit from that long term and that for me is, is, is about it matt final one from you what are the quick wins we can really make what can we look at first of all that will make a difference both to the process the economics and the problems that faces in terms of fitting into environmental uh, legislation. So I think um, the quick things is you know look at the type of claims, look how look how you you manage them. So um, whether that's you know better better triage in the claims. So um, you know, one of the things you know lots of insurance companies we work with everywhere, whether it's the UK or outside the UK, you know getting the claim to the right right place seems to be a key problem for most insurance companies so that seems a real key key area of a quick win in terms of, of getting that right i think um looking at how resilient the actual supply chain is today and actually doing doing a proper review not just for the fca but to actually look you know what would happen if if this if this if this reality was to happen i think is is a quick win to identify things you know when we work with insurers i think different insurers are doing good things in different areas so you know almost combining that collective knowledge and saying right if we could you know what would be the perfect world of the quick wins i think i think that would be another good area i think on the environment i think it's just getting started i think it is you know I, and i i know and i was a previous insurance company you know we were doing lots of good stuff about you know six seven years ago in this area and then we stopped it stops and i think you know I think you need to get back the momentum of actually some practicalities of doing some stuff. Um, and I think that that'll build then, and, and I think that would be a key, key thing on sustainability. Okay, thank you. 
If you have any questions for any four people, you want to hear more about some of the quick wins we've got, you can either contact them directly, you'll find that in the brochure, or by all means direct any questions through me at Alan I Love Claims. Thanks very much for that, it was very good indeed. Thank you. Thank you.